Yes! Yes! Okay, so we're still about like half an hour to the appointment, but I'm just gonna head to the Apple store first because I know that they've rearranged some stuff so that they can post the uh, Apple Vision Pro uh, demos. But yeah, you know, I'm just gonna head there a bit early first so that I can get a look around of the area. So yeah, see you in a bit. You know, it's kind of interesting how like the, the Apple Vision Pro is like a brand new thing that just arrived in Singapore and yet the big ad that's on their billboard is just a Safari like freaking uh, ad. I don't know why. Maybe almost as if they know that there's going to be a failure. No, I'm kidding. I think this is going to be great. But still, it's kind of interesting that they, 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 they didn't put up the ad for it. Oh, I can see it. I can see it. Can you see it? I can see it. There it is. So, uh, yeah, um, I decided to try out the Apple Vision Pro literally a day after it came out where I live. So, uh, <laughs> some of you might be wondering, like, why are you so excited about this thing? Why? Wh what's up with the hype? Why do you want to try it so badly? It ma it's mainly because I've been following this headset for years. And you might be wondering, okay, wait, wait, years? <laughs> yeah, if you don't know, there have been rumors about this headset being in development for years now. I think some of the earliest... Uh, rumors that I heard about was back all the way in 2018 or 19 when I was like a secondary school kid and even then I, it probably lasted even longer and there's been patents fought by Apple uh, like over and over again over the past few years that covers technologies that is made for like a like a headset that will eventually go on your face so, so I, I'm, I've been really excited and I've been following for years and to see that it's finally it, it finally exists in front of me Oh, okay, maybe, maybe not in front of me, but it exists out there. Apple is talking about it, it's real, and it's finally a material object that I could potentially hold. That is what makes it so exciting. And on top of that, I've also heard of a lot of YouTubers who have tried it on, and some have said good things, some have said bad things. And unlike other products like the iPhone, which is just a big slab of glass and metal, or the Apple Watch, which is, which is also just a big piece of glass and metal, I wanted to try it on because it's something that's so much more personal because it's something that goes on your face so depending on your like maybe your head shape or your eyes it might not work with you so i wanted to try it on just to also see like oh it can i even wear this thing is this something that, that i can <laughs> even use but on top of that like this is a new lineup entirely like <laughs> Like, just, like this is something that's big for Apple. Like, cause they never, almost never release a new lineup nowadays. Like, they only create a new lineup of products if they believe that they can make a big, a big impact with that lineup. It, it, it's all, it all started with the first ever Macintosh back in 1984, I think, if I recall correctly, and that introduced personal computing to the rest of the world. Then there was the iPod, which introduced, like, portable music in a real in, in in a really compact form to the, to the rest of the world then there was the iphone which okay i don't i don't i don't think this the iphone needs no introduction <laughs> then there was the ipad which basically introduced a really great tablet experience to the rest of the world then there was the apple watch which introduced a whole world of personal health tracking and then there was airpods which isn't nearly as big of an impact but it definitely pushed the wireless um audio industry forward by a lot so to see that apple is releasing a new lineup in 2024 like just a first gen product of a first of like an industry that they have never pl really played a proper part in before like the whole like headset game i'm really interested to see if this really is something that could potentially impact the way we all live some 10 years down the line hell maybe with maybe 20 30 years down the line so yeah with that being said let's see how my apple vision pro experience was like at the apple store at orchard road Since I was a bit early, I decided to walk in and take a look at the headset that was displayed at the center table of the Apple Store. And after recording some footage of it and having a look at the hardware, at around 9pm, I went up to the staff, or rather one of the Apple employees, about my appointment. And he just told me to wait around the Apple Vision Pro table for a bit and learn, and like learn more about the headset while I, while I waited. And during that time, I was able to actually get a good look at how people were using the headset at the sofa area. So people were like, you know, interacting with the headset using their fingers and like you can kind of see the eyesight thing on the headset. It, 
And although it didn't really display the eyes, it was just kind of cool to see how people were use using it from an outsider's perspective. Now, okay, now here's the part that was a bit strange. My appointment was at 9 p.m. I waited for 39 minutes before I was finally told that my uh, appointment was ready. So, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> maybe this was just because, again, this was like only a day after the headset was officially uh, like uh released so it so it, it, it maybe it's just because there's a lot of people signing up i don't know but it's a bit late <laughs> and just when i thought i could be happy that my appointment was finally up instead of sitting at the sofa i sat at the wooden table off at the side instead i got the table yay this is so fun <laughs> that's just great <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know it's nothing. It's just, it's I, I, it's just a table. There's nothing wrong about that. It's just, God, I was kind of hoping I could sit the sofa and try it out. <laughs> now, the Apple employee I was, I was with was, I, I don't know about, I don't know what's up, but they somehow seemed a bit like tense. Like they, like they did, like they, they looked a bit. I think they were a bit introverted, which is why. But they seemed a bit tensed up. Like they, like they felt like they were forced to be there. I don't know why. But regardless, they were really nice and they guided me through using the headset, how to put it on, and just in general giving me advice on how to use the software. Even though I kind of already knew because I did a lot of research. I've been waiting for this headset since like last year. But before I could put on the headset, they had to get the, my appropriate light seal and my and my lens degree. So what they did was that they basically used an iPhone to to scan my face structure to get a proper light seal and they also took my glasses so that they could scan it using some sort of machine that was situated right beside the sofas. And once those were done, I, they gave me the headset with my appropriate light seal and the appropriate lens degree. However, unfortunately, I didn't realize this at the time, but I didn't put on the headset correctly, so the light seal did not really cover the bottom of my face correctly, so there was a really big like light leakage around the bottom over here. But besides that, the rest of the seal around the face is pretty good. They guided me through the setup process, through, through some of the eye tracking calibration and the hand tracking calibration. And after that, they went through some of the various headset of the, of the Apple Vision Pro, which was honestly a really cool experience. It was pretty mind blowing to be able to interact using such simple gestures, which I will get into more later on. But the session, I, I will say, was a little bit rushed. And it was also a bit restricted because they ha had to follow like a script. I'm pretty sure those of you who have tried the dem tried out the demo as well would know that they follow a very strict script. So they couldn't really deviate far from <laughs> from that at all. And also on top of that, the store was closing. So they, they, they really wanted to get it done quick, which sucked because I really wanted to take some time to explore some more of the features of the headset. So uh, yeah. And because of all of that, I decided to sign up for a second demo session the week after. This time earlier in the afternoon so that I could actually take some time to explore the features as well as to get more time to, you know, uh, explore some of the some some of the areas of the headset that I wasn't able to touch on the previous in the previous demo session. So as time passed and a week went by, I went to the same exact Apple Store at Orchard Road for my second demo. Okay, we're now going on to our second demo. It's been a week since the first one, so I kind of hope that I can get a better chance at trying out the headset this time around to get a bit more freedom. So yeah, let's see how things go. Now this time I only waited around like 10 minutes. So yeah, that, 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 that's a good improvement. And also I got to sit at the sofa, which was pretty great. <laughs> Fortunately, this time I was able to put the headset on correctly. So the light seal, even though it's the same size as last time, it fit my face much better. And there was only a very slight light seal, light, light, or rather light leakage somewhere near the bridge of the nose around here, but it's very minor. You, you, it, it doesn't really matter all that much. Now it was in this demo session that I learned how like, um strict the script was because i tried to like ask them like what i could try out of the headset more so like i asked if i could try more environments i asked if i could open up some more apps i asked if i could you know go on open up the notes app but they they, they said no to all that and it, and they, they didn't have they didn't have any venom when they said that they really had no choice they had to follow the script which on one hand yeah they were just doing the job but on the other hand i have heard of stories of some people explaining that this is their second demo and the employee, Apple employee actually allowed them to explore completely free roam 
so uh yeah maybe i was just unlucky maybe i just need to chance upon the right apple employee that will allow me to explore it on your own but unfortunately i ended up with one that did their job faithfully so uh yeah i couldn't really try out many more features but i did try some new stuff here and there which again i will get into later on overall i think the experience was pretty smooth it was really amazing and the employees really tried their best to make me as comfortable as possible doesn't don't make it f and not make it feel like you're touching like a really like delicate piece of hardware like they really eased me into it and as expected with apple experiences in general the employees there were really nice they really wanted to guide me through the process as much as much as they can and if i faced any problems they were really patient with helping to correct for them so yeah it was a great it, it was overall a pretty smooth experience and I, I and I, I i wouldn't really say that it was a bad experience at all yes yeah, sure i didn't really get to do some of the things i wanted to do with the headset and yeah sure maybe sometimes things can get a little bit awkward but apart from that i think they did a good job of teaching me how to use the headset and getting around its quirks here and there because again this is such a new product that in general a lot of people have never experienced before so yeah they were they they really were being as help as helpful as they can to not make make the make the make the whole um headset feel so intimidating to people who are going through this demo but i will also give some points to the apple employees for also sometimes being very like honest because look a, a, a product is a product there's gonna be flaws about it and someone and a, and a lot of them sympathize with the with many what people say online where they say that the where, where certain headbands are more comfortable than others and how sometimes there might be some um awkwardness when it comes to using or rather when it comes to doing stuff with the headset on they were they were they, they were not gonna try to hide that or like twist it in any way they were just really honest and they were like yeah it can sometimes get a bit awkward and i and i really like that i like that they're not trying to you know take the problems of the headset and like sweep it under a rug and pretend it doesn't exist so um tldr i would give it an 8 out of 10 experience so yeah it's great <laughs> and with all of that being said let's finally get into the apple vision pro itself Starting off with what holds it onto your head, the Apple Vision Pro comes with two different bands, the solo knit band and the dual loop band. The former is made from a really soft, breathable fabric that is super stretchy and feels really comfortable against your head, and adjusting it is really easy by twisting the dial on the side. And when you really look into the design of the headband, you, you can tell that it has a really, really shocking amount of manufacturing magic put into it. On Apple's website, they explain that it has been 3D knitted as a single piece to create a unique rib structure that provides cushioning, breathability, and stretch. So what that means is that if you really look closely at the headband, you can tell that the band isn't like made of multiple parts being stitched separately and then sewn on together. No, it is all literally a single piece that was not made by hand, but by a freaking machine. So it seems like Apple got a manufacturer that was able to somehow literally 3D print the band, which is kind of nuts. And with this process, it basically ensures that the headband is far less prone to long-term wear and tear over multiple usages over the course of a few years. On the other hand, the dual loop band resembles a more traditional headset band with two adjustable straps above and on the back of the head that provides an alternative for those who prefer it, which can easily be done by pulling on the orange tab on the inner side of the headband. And this was a strap that I got to wear in store, and while it definitely didn't feel as soft and comfortable, and I just think it is more of a hassle, the upper strap helps with distributing the weight across the top of your head, instead of just relying on your face and the back of your head like the solo knit band, which can be quite uncomfortable for some people. I'll get into that later. And then there's the light seal, which is magnetically attached to the headset, and is made of a similar material as the solo knit band, so it's just as soft and comfortable to wear, and it conforms to the shape of your face. This allows you to wear the headset for a long period of time without feeling too hot or warm around the front of your face. 
and for something called the light seal it seals out light pretty well just make sure to put it on correctly unlike how i did it in my first demo session not too far away from the light seal is the speakers now honestly i thought that they wouldn't be that great since well it literally is just two slits on the side of the headset but in hindsight when we are talking about the same company that makes airpods and owns beats the speakers are unsurprisingly pretty good like it produces really clear and balanced sound that really adapts to the content that you're watching and i'll get more into that later on but then if you want to use the speakers you should know how to use the controls of the headset now for the most part it is done using your hands and gestures so there aren't really a whole lot of physical controls besides two buttons along the top of the headset Pushing the digital crown will open up the home view, which is basically the home screen of the Apple Vision Pro, while triple pressing on the digital crown will allow you to use an accessibility feature that you may or may not have activated in the settings app. You can also scroll the digital crown to adjust the level of immersion in an immersive environment, or you can also use it to control the level of your volume, depending on what content you're currently watching. And then there's also the other button on the other side of the headset, which basically allows you to capture immersive photos and videos depending on which you'd like to record. And that's basically it for this button. However, if you were to press it and the digital crown at the same time, you'd be able to take a screenshot of what you're looking at. And if you were to press and hold both of them simultaneously, you will be able to shut down the Apple Vision Pro, just like how you do it on an Apple Watch. Now let's move on to the most eye-catching part of the headset, which is the eyesight feature that is on the outside display of the Apple Vision Pro. Now the intended purpose of this feature is to prevent a disconnection between Apple Vision Pro users and other people around them, as well as to alert others of what an Apple Vision Pro user is currently looking at. Now the eyesight screen can actually display a whole bunch of different hues and colors depending on what the user is looking at, but basically, if it displays a clear view of the user's eyes, that means that they're currently having an unobstructed view of their surroundings. Whereas if there is a purple hue of different intensities, that means that the windows that they're looking at or the immersive environment that they're in is either partially or fully blocking their view of their surroundings. Now the headset is able to display your eyes by using multiple inner infrared cameras to display your eyes on a lenticular display that produces an illusion of depth. However, in most scenarios, it's too dim to notice and with the highly reflective front cover glass, it really is hard for anyone to see what's being displayed. And on top of that, it's also pretty low resolution and it... It's pretty uncanny. <laughs> Now, just right below the eyesight screen is the cameras of the headset. Now, they're able to take spatial photos and videos of pretty decent quality, and it's pretty close to the quality of iPhone cameras. And it also helps with accurately tracking surfaces, hand gestures, and depth information. But besides that, it also enables pass-through, which allows the surroundings to be recorded through the cameras and to be displayed on your eyes so that you know what's around you. And that feature is put to full use with the help of the screens, which is able to display some of the most highest resolution content there is of any headset with the help of a micro OLED display the size of a postage stamp for each eye that has more pixels than a 4K TV, which is pretty nuts. If you've seen some videos online, you can see how like compared to an iPhone display, the pixels are far more densely packed, which is honestly incredible and with a refresh rate that can vary from 90 to 100 hertz the display is buttery smooth and responsive to your eyes and i don't really feel motion sick when using it but of course to power all of that hardware you also need the processing power now unlike other headsets this thing has two processors the m2 which is already present in some of apple's macbooks and ipads does normal processing like graphics rendering and system processors and all the other stuff that you'd expect a processor in a computer to do. And then there's the R1 processor which is brand new and has never been seen in any Apple product before and its job is to basically process information from all of the sensors to ensure that there is as minimal delay as possible from taking what the headset sees to displaying them to your eyes. In fact, that delay is only around 12 milliseconds. However, despite how powerful these processors are, they're really efficient so the fans do not really spin up very loudly and you can barely hear them which is pretty much expected with Apple Silicon nowadays. Now let's touch on the build quality of the headset. Now honestly, it is very well built as expected for any Apple product because unlike any other headsets out there, it is made of an aluminum alloy frame with a laminated glass cover on the front that gives the headset a durable and premium feel that you really can't find anywhere else. Unfortunately, with such higher quality materials, the headset is much heavier than a conventional headset, 
so it can get uncomfortable to wear over a long period of time, especially with the fact that the solo knit band does, doesn't really have any way of distributing the weight properly. So it places a lot of pressure on the front of your face, and that's on top of the neck pain that you may experience after wearing the headset for a long period of time. In fact, right now, there's a really popular third-party accessory available that helps to alleviate the pressure on your face when wearing the headset with the solo knit band, and so far, reviews have been pretty positive. <laughs> Anyways, it's a good thing that the battery is separated from the headset and is connected via a wire instead, cause adding that weight onto the already heavy headset would <laughs> make it unbearable. <laughs> Now, speaking of the battery, it provides up to two hours of regular use and two and a half hours of video playback. Now, it's not great compared to other headsets. In fact, you can't even watch some movies in a single sitting with this kind of battery life. But you wouldn't want to wear the headset for that long anyways. And if you do, the battery can be charged while still using the headset. So yeah. Now, finally, we have the accessories that is sold for the Apple Vision Pro. Now, officially from Apple, we get a travel case which is this really big, like, white-coloured pill, which I guess is to provide protection if you ever do drop it by accident, but it's still pretty bulky, and the exterior is made of this, of, like, the same material you, that you'd find on a winter jacket, and it's also white in colour, so it's gonna stain pretty easily over time. And then we have the Belkin battery holder, which basically allows you to attach the battery pack that comes with the Apple Vision Pro, either to the belt of your pants or just directly onto the side of your pants, so I guess that adds a bit of convenience if you're into that. Now that being said, let's move on to the software that powers the Apple Vision Pro Vision OS. Starting off with the home view, you get a very familiar experience to what you get on iOS and iPadOS, such as being able to access the control center by looking above and pinching your fingers to get quick access to many familiar controls like Wi-Fi and AirDrop, and pinching and letting go or moving sideways allows you to view multiple pages of apps. However, it also comes with some additional features here and there, such as a side tab that allows you to switch between your apps, your environments, and your contacts. Starting with the apps, their circular icons float in front of you. Now by default, Vision OS comes with Apple TV, Music, Mindfulness, Settings, Freeform, Safari, Photos, Notes, App Store, Mail, Messages, Keynote, Files, Tips, and Encounter Dinosaurs. I'll get into the last part a bit later. But besides those default Vision OS apps, it also does come with some default compatible apps, which are basically apps that would be found on the iPhone and iPad, but have been ported over to Vision OS without the whole Vision OS like glass look to it, but still just looks like a typical iPhone iPad app, such as books, calendar, home, maps, news, podcasts. So yeah, it's a pretty decent array of apps to begin with. When it comes to system navigation, as I said before, there are no controllers, so you just use your hands to navigate through the OS. So first off, you tap your thumb and your index finger together like a pinch to tap, then you tap and hold and then move to drag, then you tap and hold and then move and let go all really quickly to swipe through pages. Or alternatively, you can just simply go up to an object in the, in, in the virtual space and just interact with it directly using your hands. Basically like a big giant touch screen, but I wouldn't recommend that since you have to walk up to it and interact with it. But when you open up an app, there'll be a few more controls that you can mess around with. So first of all, if you want to resize a window, you basically look at the bottom right corner of that window and you drag it to increase and decrease the size of it. Then you can move the whole window by looking down at the bottom white bar that just hovers right beneath the window to drag it around and put the window wherever you like to in your virtual space. And then if you want to close the window, you just simply look at the little white dot right beside the white bar from before, and then you tap it, and then it closes the window as expected. For my own usage, I found it pretty easy to use, and this whole system really allows you to have like a multi-monitor setup that is pretty customizable and portable, which like a typical traditional multi-monitor setup up can't achieve like it's not like you can just move your <laughs> monitors around i mean you could but it's well i mean not easy <laughs> but this is especially really cool when you pair, pair the apple vision pro with your macbook so that you can stream the macbook's display into your headset and resize the window and use the headset to basically turn it into a big large portable monitor for your macbook however from what i hear online there are users that say that loading more than four apps 
will cause the headset to restart repeatedly, presumably because of the fact that it's 16GB of RAM is being filled out completely, so yeah, you can probably only multitask with 4 apps at most. Anything more and you might run into some issues. Now besides that, we also have the pass-through footage for, of the Apple Vision Pro, which is one of the highest quality and highest resolution headset pass-throughs in the industry. Like, I wore it for myself and it's pretty good. It, like, like, it adapts really well to decently lit rooms and the post-processing of the footage makes, the, makes it all look so good that it, that it really legitimately feels like I'm just looking through my own eyes instead of through a, pair, through a bunch of cameras. And when it comes to color accuracy, it's not the best, but it's still pretty decent to my eyes at least. However, I will say that the pass-through is unfortunately still not good enough to like see things on my phone's display very clearly if I were to say like, hold it like this, like if I wore the headset right now and I use it like this, the display will be a bit blurred. So uh, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. And don't get me wrong, you could theoretically still use your phone like that. It just wouldn't be a very <laughs> great experience. And also since the pass-through is still being done with cameras, the moment you enter like a, a, a place with low lighting conditions or there are flickering lights or there are harsh lighting conditions like maybe under the sun, then the pass-through quality might worsen a little bit. But let's say you don't want to work in your own room. Well, then there's also a lot of immersive environments that will allow you to basically virtually transport yourself to an, an entirely different environment. And there are many of them to choose from, and they are very realistic looking, all the way down from like how the water droplets fall into a lake nearby, to the sound of like the light drizzle of rain as it falls down in the virtual space. And it really creates this like really calming and peaceful virtual environment to work in. Now, some of the available environments are Hale ha Halekala, Yosemite, Morning Light, Spring Light, Joshua Tree, Mount Hood, which is the one that I did, Summer Light, Fall Light, The Moon, White Sands, Winter Light, and Fall Light. Now, with that being said, let's finally move on to the apps that I was able to try during my demo experience. Now first off, we have the Photos app, which, not gonna lie, even though it was a really short period of time that I was able to spend in that app, it really changes the way you look back at your, at your gallery, whether it's trying to look at your old memories, or if it's just trying to find an old receipt that you've been struggling to find this entire time. Like, it especially shines through when it comes to looking at spatial photos and videos, where it feels like the moment that has been captured in that photo or video is like happening again right in front of you, because of the whole 3D depth that it provides. It, like, it almost feels like you could reach out and touch the touch the subject in the photo, whether if it's like your kids or your parents inside of it. And even for normal photos, it just feels so much better than if you were to look at, say, a photo on just your phone or even on your tablet or on a TV because there's still that physical object that's displaying it. But when you're in the Photos app on the Vision Pro, it really feels like the photo is just there, floating in front of you to look at the memories that you've had over the past few years of you capturing photos and videos, even if it's not the spatial format that is new to the Apple Vision Pro. Like, it really almost feels like you're time traveling back into the past. It's, it's kind of crazy. But another cool thing about the Photos app is that when you open up panoramas, you can fully zoom into the panorama and feel like you're in the location again. Like. I have some panoramas from back when I was in Japan last year, where I took some panoramas of me at, say, Mount Fuji. And if I had the Vision Pro, I could load that photo up into the headset and then display it fully in front of me, like full on wrap around my whole my whole body so that it feels like I'm in the moment again, like I'm there in Japan, which is incredible. Now let's move on to Safari and the App Store. Now, they're mostly the same experience, like and like it's really just the normal Safari and App Store, but with the whole Vision OS glass look to it. Like functionally, they both perform mostly the same as on an iPad or on an iPhone. Really the only new things is that, oh, it's in Vision OS, so you could like, oh, resize the window. You could put it wherever you want in your virtual space and it all, all looks like sheets of glass. So yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of functionality. But now that we're here, if you want to search up something, how do you type? Now, when you tap on a search field, again using the same pinch gesture, a little like virtual keyboard will appear that will allow you to type using the pinch gesture or by just tapping on the keyboard itself. However, it cannot register more than one tap at a time, so good luck trying to like touch type on or just like type fast in general on this thing. So you need to like tap each key one by one. <laughs> but then there's also another option where you can just use the dictation function, but 
I personally have never really had a good track record when it comes to using dictation. It always mixes up my words. So yeah, that may not be a good option for many people. If you really want to properly type on this thing, you really should just get an external Apple Magic keyboard connected. And no, not the one with the AA battery. So um, you're going to need to shell a few more dollars if you want to type properly on the Apple Vision Pro. <laughs> and then there's the Mindfulness app, which is just a simple app that allows you to meditate and reflect on your day. And the way it works is that basically the surroundings kind of like dim and petal like shapes will like slowly move from in front of you and go past you as the speaker guides you through like a reflection session that is pretty calming. But I couldn't really get very zen since I was in a really noisy Apple store. <laughs> Overall, it's a pretty neat app for those of you who use these kinds of software. And then we come to the really interesting addition on Apple Vision Pro, which is the Encounter Dinosaurs app. Now, this isn't the kind of thing that you would never expect to come by default on an Apple product, but basically it's an immersive experience that brings you to the world of dinosaurs and really just gets you as close as you can without having to be there in a moment. And being able to see the dinosaurs literally like break through the app window and like into your own personal space is kind of scary even though it's clearly CGI like it almost feels like it was like breathing directly onto your face as they approached me like and even when I like reached my hand out towards it it noticed that and it like snapped its its jaws at my hand <laughs> however I think the most amazing part about the experience was this really simple moment at the beginning of it where like a butterfly is like flying around and it literally like lands on your finger like hold it out and it lands on your finger wherever it is and it and I must say it the, the tracking on the Apple Vision Pro is really good because even after it landed on my finger, I can twist it around here and there and I move it. It still stays locked onto my finger. It like it orients itself to the orientation of my finger, which is pretty cool. And then there's the star of the show in my opinion, the Apple TV app. Now again, thanks to Vision OS, when watching films or TV shows on it, you can easily resize them to literally literally be as big as a cinema display without having to go to one. You can just do this all in your own home. And you can even enable a mode that immerses you in a literal cinema to like complete the experience. In fact, you can actually choose if you want to sit in the front row or the middle row or the back row. <laughs> Although I must say though, if you're like primarily at home and you can afford a Vision Pro, I don't see why you shouldn't just get like a decent 4k tv for like a cheaper price but pushing that aside i think the best part of the app was when it showed off what will soon come to the apple tv app so basically there's this video called experience immersive where it basically allows you to see a whole range of content recorded in apple's new video format called the apple immersive format which records 8k 3d video with spatial audio creating this like super incredible like audio and visual experience where you feel like you are in the content itself from watching a singer performing right in front of you to witnessing a soccer game as you stand right on the field and get a perspective that a typical video can never achieve like really no words can <laughs> describe how incredible it was like i'm not even kidding many youtubers also have the exact same reaction and to be honest you will have to watch it for yourself with the headset if you really want to understand what I mean. And honestly, I can definitely see how this format might get more popular in the future. Like, I don't really feel like it's a gimmick. I feel like it has the potential to be something so much more. But besides the Apple TV app, there are also many other apps that I was hoping to try, but I wasn't able to, like the Notes app and the Keynote app, which again should work very similarly to how their iOS and iPad OS counterparts function, but now with like the Vision OS magic on top of it. In fact, like the Keynote app has this really cool environment where you can rehearse your slides in the literal Steve Jobs theater in Apple Park which is really cool because not a lot of people get to visit that place so that's a pretty cool bonus. Yeah although I can't really say much about the rest of the default apps I would imagine that they should have a similar experience to what I had. Very familiar yet much more capable or at least having the potential to be so much better. Now with all of that being said it really brings up the question of why would anyone buy this like why would one buy the apple vision pro over a cheaper alternative like the meta quest or the valve index that have existed for a while now and have a more significant audience so what makes this headset so appealing to certain people what makes it you know an apple headset <laughs> and to unlock the phone i just take my finger and slide it across all right you want to see that again go to sleep we wanted something that you couldn't do by accident in your pocket and just slide it across 
Well, the reason why people usually buy Apple products over anything else is because of the fact that they usually have that Apple magic to them in which it has this user experience that you don't really get on other products until Apple comes along and then the competitors follow along like how if you if you like open the airpods case you get this nice little pop-up on the screen that like says oh airpods and stuff like that or how like when you have a newer iphone there's this dynamic island that like adapts to what you do and what apps are open and stuff like that and when it comes to the apple vision pro there are certainly parts of the software that really contributes to that apple magic in both good ways and bad, such as the way pass-through works when it comes to other people around you walking past as you're using the headset. Like, if you were to, say, have an environment or a window that is blocking your view, the UI would fade away whenever a person approaches you or, like, comes to talk to you, which basically ensures that if even if you are, like, Im entirely immersed in your virtual environment, you will always know when someone is interacting with you when you're not looking. And on top of that, when you're fully immersed in an environment, the software does a really, really good job at perfectly or rather almost perfectly cutting out your hand such that even if you're fully immersed, you can still see your hands when you're inside that virtual space. And it even color corrects the tone of your hand in such a way that it looks like you are actually inside that environment such as if you if you're say on the moon then it will correctly light your hand in, in accordance to the lighting that you would expect on the moon or if you say you're by a lake it will also correctly color your hands in such a way that you are by a lake now even though the cutout is not perfect like if you were to move your hands super fast then the cutout kind of fails a little bit and because it only applies to your hands, the rest of your body is gone, so you can't see like your 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 torso or your legs, so it's a bit strange to see your body just gone like that. I still feel that this nice little touch really adds to the immersion when you're using the, the environments in the headset. But besides that, when it comes to the gestures in the Apple Vision Pro, it feels very easy to use and very natural with like very little learning curve because it's very similar to the way that multi-touch works on your iPhone or your iPad or basically any modern touchscreen surface where if you swipe on the screen, it will expectedly move the object being displayed on the screen to move along with your finger. And when you do the same thing in the Apple Vision Pro but with a pinch, it also does exactly that. So it really isn't that difficult to use at all and you will get used to it in no time. And when it comes to these gestures, it's also really convenient to use them. Like you don't have to like raise your hand in front of your face and like interact like this. No, you can literally just rest your hands on your lap and, and do the whole gesture thing. And fortunately, the headsets, the sensors and cameras will be able to pick it up. Although I will say that the only caveat to this whole gesture system is if you were to like move your hand in such a way that like it can't see the other finger. So right now you can see the pinch over here. But the moment it's like this, it's a bit harder to tell. So I have had a few times when I'm using the gestures and it and it I just so happen to position my hands in such a way that one finger is being blocked. So it can't tell that I'm pinching. And I don't realize this for a few times. I keep trying to pinch and pinch and pinch until I orient them correctly. And then boom, it recognizes it immediately. So yeah, that's a strange but understandable caveat that this, this whole gesture system has. But yeah, as long as you do these gestures in the correct form and like not block one finger over the other, the, the headset can pick it up pretty reliably. And throughout my time using the headset, there, was, there wasn't any time where it falsely triggered at all, which is pretty good. But I feel like one of the parts of the headset that people don't really talk about online is the fact that if you have like prescriptions or like you have reading glasses, you can get Zeiss lenses to be customized to your degree or whatever you're prescribed with, which can then be magnetically attached to the inside of the Vision Pro in such a way that you can use the headset without having to put on your glasses. Because I have had a few moments where I've worn headsets, on, headsets in the past where I have to put my glasses on and then the headset, which don't get me wrong, it works, but it, it's a bit inconvenient. And with the Apple Vision Pro, with the help of the custom Zeiss lenses, you don't even need these glasses. Just take it off, put on the headset, and it's pretty comfortable not having to worry about a stupid set of spectacles getting in your way. And once you put on the headset for the first time, one of the really awesome aspects of this Apple Vision Pro is the fact that it could automatically adjust the interpupillary eye distance, or basically the distance between, between each eye, because... For each person, obviously this distance will definitely vary. There are people who have it closer, for the people who have it further. 
I think mine's a bit further than normal, but yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, the headset can do this automatically for you. You just press and hold the, the digital crown when you're setting it up and it will just adjust right then and there like that which is which compared to other headsets where you have to adjust this thing manually with your like with like a uh, control on, on the top it's very convenient very easy to use and you don't have to worry about setting it perfectly because the headset can do it for you but once this all set up and you're in the os when it comes to detecting where your eyes are at it is shockingly good like whenever you look at certain icons they kind of re react to your eye contact and become three-dimensional like for example, if I look at the Photos app, you will see how like the flower petals will kind of like pop up a little bit to give that illusion of depth, which really adds that sense of liveliness to the OS on top of the really, really accurate eye tracking that this headset has. Like it so far hasn't failed me a single time and it's really accurate. It's kind of eerie how accurate it is. Like it's, it's almost like it's reading your mind whenever you're looking around at certain UI elements to touch certain interfaces using your fingers. But I feel like what really adds to the realism of the applications and windows whenever they're open is that when you look closely at the sides and the edges of individual windows, they render highlights along them to simulate the reflections that you'd expect when a sheet of glass is literally placed inside of your room. So it almost gives you a sense that you're interacting with floating pieces of glass that magically displays wherever you want. Like, it really feels like these windows are like in front of you like they're real like they're not like virtual objects but they're in your space which <laughs> it's quite magical <laughs> but of course when it comes to any headset ar vr or whatever it's very important for them to have very accurate surface tracking and in the past it's usually done with external sensors installed in your room and but nowadays headsets don't really need those anymore and they can do it automatically within the headset itself and fortunately with the apple vision pro it's pretty good. Like, Apple has been working on this for years now. In fact, AR has been a thing on iPhone since 2018. Oh, no, not 2018? 2018. Or 2017? 2017. <laughs> and when you use AR on, on your iPhone or iPad or any compatible Apple device, it's really good. So it isn't surprising that the Apple Vision Pro excels at this department. Whenever you move your head or you move to another room, the windows stay exactly where they are. They never move at all. It is locked in place. It really, again, it really feels like it's there physically in the room with you. And to add on to that Apple magic, whenever you're playing any sort of media, the surroundings dim slightly to basically make your content more front and center and make it pop more to your eyes. Such as in the Photos app, where if you were to open up a photo, the surroundings will dim and it will basically make your memories just pop out a little more. But I feel like one of the more unique aspects of the Apple Vision Pro is how it's able to express your attention to other people using the eyesight display on the front. Because it is able to convey to other people around you whether or not if you are working with apps or if you are entirely immersed or whether or not you can see them clearly. Because there's this thing about headsets in the past where if you're wearing them, people outside would have no idea whether or not you're doing something else or if you're secretly prying on them using the outside cameras. But with the Apple headset and how it's able to use the eyesight display, people will feel more relieved to know whether or not you can see them or not, which I feel will help make the social interaction a bit less awkward whenever someone is using the headset. But anyways, moving on from that, I feel like one of the more clever designs of the headset is the way that it renders images on the displays on the inside. Now, okay, so if you don't know already, the human eye only has the immediate front of its vision in focus. So basically, whatever you're focusing on, that's the only part of it that's in focus. Whereas your peripheral vision is more blurred and actually less saturated. So to save on system resources, the headset uses something called foveated rendering, where only the area of the screen that you're looking at is rendered in full resolution, while everything else is rendered with lesser resolution. Which you can actually tell from screen recordings of the Apple Vision Pro's software that has been shown off online. This basically allows for more processing power to be dedicated to everything else, because Let's think about it, what's the point of rendering the full thing if you're not even going to be looking at the full thing in focus all the time? <laughs> it just makes more sense to put those resources on something else. Fortunately, you will never really notice the foveated rendering, like even I didn't notice it. Due to the really like super incredibly low latency of the visuals of the headset. This is thanks to the R1 chip which does an 
excellent job at ensuring that there is as little lag as possible when it comes to taking what the camera sees to processing and rendering them in the displays with the UI and Windows. In fact, Apple says that there is a 12 millisecond latency between the light entering the cameras to the light that eventually lands on your eyes. Although real world tests have shown that that number is closer to around 11 milliseconds, which is far better than many other headsets, which usually have a latency that hovers around 35 to 40 milliseconds. And for context, the human reaction time is around 250 milliseconds. So that is really fast. And because of that, I think that the chances of you getting motion sickness when using the headset is lesser. I mean, not that you won't get motion sickness. I know that, th that there are people who will be very prone to such illnesses, but I think there will be a lower chance of getting that with the Apple Vision Pro. Now, besides that, despite having so many cameras on the front of the headset, the R1 chip does a great job at ensuring that the footage from each one is stitched together really well with minimal distortion. Unlike other headsets that often have like a crazy amount of distortion and terrible footage stitching, like in fact, if you look at the footage that often comes out of the MetaQuest, th there is often a lot of distortion, especially when it comes to putting objects near the cameras, like it really looks bad. <laughs> Fortunately, the Apple Vision Pro does a pretty decent job at, it, at minimizing those distortions. Now, one last thing I want to touch on when it comes to the Apple magic of the Apple Vision Pro is something called audio ray tracing that they've talked about. Now, basically what that does is, is that it detects the size of the room that you're in such that audio sources within your virtual space will sound like it's actually within your room. Like, for example, when you're talking to someone in FaceTime in, say, a large room with flat walls, it can detect the room and its size and make their voices sound more echoey to match the environment. But it's also really smart about it too. So when you're in an environment, for example, the audio will adapt to the environment. So if you're at Mount Hood, the audio will become far less echoey and more clear as if, again, the sound source is within Mount Hood. It really adds to the sensation that what you're seeing in the headset is actually right in front of you, which, again, Apple magic! But of course with everything that Apple does, there will always be some downside to the way that they do things. So with that being said, let's talk about that. While the headset is really good at minimizing color distortion near the edges of the display to ensure a better quality compared to other headset displays, this often results in the FOV being way smaller than what you see on other headsets. Now, although this is something that one can get used to after some time, it still is a bit jarring and it kind of decreases the immersiveness of the headset because of just how big and thick the black borders on the sides are. And this is often the reason why some people have actually decided to remove the light seal so that their eyes can are closer to the displays so that they can get like a larger FOV. Now, while we're still on the topic of immersiveness, although it is really good, the speakers on the headset are, well, they're, they're still speakers, so everyone around you can hear what you're hearing. So if you plan on watching a certain genre of content, I think it's best to just use like AirPods with the headset. Now on the topic of the Apple immersive format, as awesome as it is, there are currently very few videos that are shot in this new format. So we're gonna have to wait and see if this new format will get popular enough before more videos are shot this way. Either that, or it fails and almost no videos are recorded like this, especially considering the fact that you need very high-tech equipment to record using this format. Now, when it comes to the software that currently runs on the Apple Vision Pro, there are currently still many apps that most people are familiar with that don't really run on the headset. In fact, some developers have deliberately opted out from deploying the apps on the Vision OS App Store, such as YouTube or Spotify or Netflix, so that is something that you have to keep in mind. Currently right now, there are a few third-party apps that try and replicate those apps. I know there's one, I think, called um, Juno for YouTube. I, I, don't, I can't remember the name, but it's basically an app that replicates the, the YouTube app, but for the Apple Vision Pro. If, you, if, if anyone out there is, use, is, is watching this and using the headset, you should check it out. <laughs> now, remember what I said earlier about the Zeiss lenses? Now, again, awesome and all, but the problem... <laughs> is that the normal lenses themselves, and keep in mind, without any prescriptions at, at all, cost 99 US dollars and 149 US dollars for prescription lenses. So getting them is not cheap. And if you have a change in your eyesight, you're going to have to pay full price for a new pair. And if you want to have someone else use the headset, 
you have to get another pair of lenses for them to use. So yeah, not great for those like me who have prescriptions or wants other people to use them. <laughs> and besides the custom Zeiss lenses, there is also the custom light seal. And because it is made custom for each person's face, if you want to let someone else use the headset, again, you have to either hope that their face shape is similar to yours, or else you're going to have to purchase another light seal and shell out 199 US dollars for that. Yay! <laughs> okay, but if you want to use the headset on the go, unless you're on an airplane, good luck trying to use this when you're moving because the windows stay completely pinned to where they are. <laughs> I actually think that this might be a thing to prevent people from like using this while walking, as we've seen from like many crazy people trying to use this thing while driving a car or walking about on the street, which I don't know about you, but I don't think that's safe. But I mean, besides that, it can get quite annoying if you want to work in different places, such as your office and at home, because each time you move to somewhere else, you have to close and reopen every single app and window that you had open. So that can be quite a bit of a hassle. Now, another thing that I want to point out is the solo knit band that is basically in every single Apple promo ad. And like I pointed out just now, although it's very soft and breathable compared to the competition, because the strap only goes along the back side of your head and the headset is already super heavy alone, it puts a lot of pressure on your cheeks, which can get quite uncomfortable. But if you try to combat this by like tightening the band, then a lot of pressure will be placed onto the region around your eyes, which will leave some unpleasant marks on your face. Now, let's talk about the one thing that Apple really does not like that much, parability. <laughs> Unsurprisingly for Apple, they have done a terrible job at making this headset easy to repair. Because of how densely compact everything is in the headset, there are countless connectors and screws to get through in order to disconnect and remove a part that needs replacement, especially those buried deep into the headset. And this, all this assumes that you can even open up the headset without breaking or scratching it. This all probably explains why repairing the headset at Apple or even just purchasing Apple Care Plus is so bloody expensive. Although there's one good thing that this thing does in terms of repairability. Since the battery is an external component, compared to other headsets which have them buried internally replacing the batteries as easy as you know changing phone cases you just simply like unplug it take a new battery plug it in and that's it <laughs> that, that, that that's pretty easy that i'll give it to them but then finally there's the price i mean just pull up apple.com and look for yourself it's it's self-explanatory <laughs> but with all that being said there's still the question of why does this headset exist? Why did Apple spend so many years investing in its research and finally releasing it? Like, what's their end goal? What's, what's, the, what's Apple's dream here? <laughs> so in the same way that Mac introduced us to personal computing and iPhone introduced us to mobile computing, Apple Vision Pro will introduce us to spatial computing. This marks the beginning of a journey that will bring a new dimension to powerful personal technology. Now, the most obvious answer to that is that they want to earn profit. <laughs> I mean, of course. But to earn as much profit as they want, they want everyone to begin taking this industry more seriously, more specifically the VR and AR industry. In the same way that everyone got obsessed with like the iPhone, the iPad, the iPod, and the Apple Watch. Because for a long time, VR headsets have always been seen by most as like a gimmick that's more suited for professionals and gamers, despite its potential to become something much more than that. And seeing that potential, Apple wants to take it in a different direction and promote this less of a dedicated gaming device or a 3D viewer and instead more of as a way for everyday people to do what they already do, but better. I mean, look at how Apple is withholding from using familiar terms like VR or AR and, you, and, and instead using more novel terms like spatial computing. And that's because it's designed not to follow these two categories strictly. Now, for those of you who don't know, virtual reality or VR is when you take the user and put them in a different virtual environment, whereas augmented reality or AR takes a virtual object and puts it in the user's environment. And Apple Vision Pro's OS is more akin to mixed reality or MR, which combines both categories into one, which is evident with the way virtual apps kind of just float and respond to changes in your space, but you can also turn on environments to take you to a different place virtually. And with that in mind, Apple wants to make use of whatever they have to turn the headset into something that will make the lives of people around the world a lot better in many ways. Just like how the iPhones help make looking at emails, browsing the internet, and listening to music so much easier. And while it does come at a price that's hard to swallow, 
Apple definitely seems locked into making this device much more affordable down the line. I mean, just look at the name alone. It kind of suggests that Apple may one day release a cheaper Apple Vision model sooner or later, which is backed up by rumors that Apple has stopped all plans to make a new Vision Pro model and pivot away to making a more cheaper model instead. All of this so that they can get as many people as possible to use this product one day. I mean, they used this tactic with the pricing of the original iPhone versus the iPhone 3G, so it should probably work out. And Apple seems to be really confident that this will succeed because they've already previewed the upcoming Vision OS 2 software update at WWDC 2024 with features that aims to make the OS far more useful for users, such as being able to turn existing images in your gallery into spatial photos, trim videos right in the headset, new gestures to more easily access the home view and control center, rearrange apps in the home view, widescreen support for Mac virtual displays, new environments, improvements to personas, mouse support, train support, and many, many more. But with that in mind, what does Apple want the headset and its software to be like some 10 years down the line? Well, you have to look at how the iPhone progressed to really get a good picture of that. Because what made the iPhone Apple's biggest success in history and changed the world is that it combines many tools people are familiar with into a single device. And what made it appeal to such a large audience was not that it had the same level of usefulness as a standalone flashlight or a games console or desktop browser or record player. But what made it sell was that it had many of those features all in your pocket and in your reach at all times without the inconvenience of having to carry multiple bulkier items around all the time. It is due to this success that the iPhone has grown from its humble beginnings as a 3-in-1 device for music, internet browsing and calling, to becoming an incredibly capable device that can do almost anything from playing games and taking beautiful videos, to measuring distances and controlling home devices with just a tap. All in just 10 years. Now, in its current state, the Apple Vision Pro weighing near a total of 1 kilo with the battery does not come close to the iPhone's level of convenience and maturity, but that isn't really Apple's concern right now. This headset exists now because they want to get as many people as possible to begin making content for the Vision OS ecosystem, whether if it is by having normal people record more spatial video on newer iPhones, or by getting developers to develop their apps to make use of the hardware and software of the Apple Vision Pro. Alongside that, Apple has already had countless patents filed for even more features that might come to the headset at some point. All of this so that a couple of generations down the lineup, Apple may be able to eventually turn what we have today into a portable set of smart glasses that you can put on your face and can go wherever you want to to achieve a level of convenience and utility that supersedes that of the iPhone. It will be able to run Vision OS with no pass-through cameras required because there will essentially be no visible hardware separating your vision from the world. In such a form factor, you will no longer have to think about whether or not you'll need to lunge around your laptop or your headset before leaving your home because it is so compact and lightweight that just like your phone, you can just easily bring your glasses along without worrying about its inconvenience, even if you end up not using Vision OS at all. And in the off chance that you end up do needing to, say, quickly open up your notes or hop onto an online meeting or search up something, you can simply wake it up like how one would with an iPhone and the glasses will be ready to do whatever you'd like. But this all still leaves us with the question that is in the thumbnail and in the title of this video. Is this really the future or will this fail spectacularly like the trash can Mac Pro or the butterfly keyboard? Well, the truth is, it's still too early to really tell for certain, but that doesn't mean that we can't imagine what each scenario will look like. So now let's say that the headset will succeed and almost everyone has it in their hands. Now as the headset's user base expands and more people begin demanding for more content for it, we would see a massive, massive surge in developers beginning to adapt to the three-dimensional interface that taps into a user's personal space. Today, we already see many new apps for the Apple Vision Pro that takes advantage of that connection to the real world, such as Game Room, which allows you to play many games with another player while feeling like it's all happening in your own space, Piano Flowing Tiles that literally takes the music visualizers from all of those videos on YouTube and places them right in front of your piano to help you know when and which key to press, or Sky Guide, which places a location-accurate view of the stars in the night sky right in front of you, which is especially useful for people like me who can't see anything in the sky because of light pollution. But of course, 
software is just one thing. With more demand for 3D content, there would be an urgency for many industries to begin adopting compatible formats and purchasing the right equipment to film, record, and handle 3D content, which alone would enable even more amazing software solutions. Some concepts of the future Vision OS apps include 3D views of F1 races and NBA matches that places the action right in front of you, take virtual tours of potential homes, or even preview IKEA furniture right in your living room. The best part, however, is that gathering so much new attention on mixed reality would also convince many existing and new competitors to also contribute more into this industry. As of recording, companies like Meta have already begun to promote their existing headsets in a manner that heavily resembles how the Apple does it. So it isn't hard to extrapolate and imagine Meta and other companies beginning to design headsets that also adopts Apple's ideas and maybe even doing some things better than them. Such competition would provide the momentum to keep pushing the industry forward and further increasing the number of options for consumers. And I mean, who knows, man, in the more distant future, there is a likelihood that mixed reality headsets become so prevalent that they become just as commonplace as smartphones. And almost any organization would have some sort of app or content that is designed for such headsets, which would allow almost anyone to be able to experience content and do their work at a whole new level of immersion and of flexibility. However, just like everything else, such a future would also present some unfortunate consequences as well. I mean, just look at how the iPhone alone changed the world after it came out. I mean, it got popular and more people started using them and eventually competitors started showing up to the competition. And now the smartphone as a whole has become an indispensable tool in all of our lives. But unfortunately, that sudden change in lifestyle came with some costs. Because ever since the boom in smartphone ownership, People have become addicted to being on screens all the time, our attention spans have decreased, and children are more exposed to unsafe online content, and many of us have become less social, which is kind of ironic, considering that many use smartphones to use social media, which is a range of platforms that were supposed to make us more social, and that only ended up doing the complete opposite. <laughs> but to really get a good sensing of how smartphones have impacted us since its inception, I think it's good that we leave this space and have a look outside. I mean, just look at how the world looks like today versus 10 years ago. So much has changed at that time that it's sometimes easy to forget just how different our lives were. I mean, just look at people on public transport, for example. Decades ago, train cabins looked like this. <laughs> But now they look like this. Look, I'm not trying to be a boomer and say that like, oh, oh, smartphones are all bad and it's evil and it's going to be the end of all mankind. Or that I'm an exception from everyone else. Not at all. In fact, truth be told, I'm also guilty of having issues trying to spend less time on screen or even trying to start a conversation in person sometimes. Which is why if the Apple Vision Pro does succeed, there is a chance that things might only get worse from here. Because the moment people become way too obsessed with the headset, users will begin to spend more time in the virtual world instead, and the social problem that smartphones accelerated would only exacerbate it even more, which can pose a massive threat to those who've become so disconnected that they forget, they've sometimes may forget to check their surroundings and end up hurting someone. Even now, there are already instances of people using the headset while carrying out certain activities like driving a car or walking on the streets with the Vision Pro on which can pose a threat to other people around them. On top of that, with how capable the headset could become, it will come as no surprise that people would spend less time outside of the comfort of their homes, choosing to be immersed in their virtual environments around the world instead of putting in the effort to go to them in person. While such a feature would be fantastic for those who may not be physically or psychologically be able to travel to certain places, especially if they are hard to reach, like locations in nature, this may not bode very well for those who are perfectly fit to do so in real life. Being able to be transported to beautiful sceneries without having to go through the challenge of getting to such places would cause many people to have less incentive to partake in more strenuous but otherwise beneficial activities that could help one's health such as hiking, rock climbing, camping, canoeing, and so many more. And spending so much time just sitting at home will not only lead to a decline in people's physical and mental health, as seen from the pandemic alone, but people will also begin showing less interest in being physically present in an environment, such as right now. I'm at East Coast Park and it's 
really nice here. The sea breeze is very nice, very cooling. The sun is bright and not very hot considering sea breeze helping out a bit. And seeing people cycling around is pretty nice. And headsets like the Apple Vision Pro may one day deprive people's appreciation of our own reality, as harsh as it may be sometimes. Take the moon environment, for example. Yes, it's incredible, serene, lifeless, lonely. It's a world that's so different from ours, which makes it all the more amazing to witness it right in front of your eyes. But the thing is that the only reason that this is even possible to begin with, the only reason this environment exists, is because of humanity's ancestral fascination for the lunar body that has lasted for as long as humans have existed for. And it was only relatively recently in the history of our species that all of that obsession finally paid off when we took on the seemingly impossible and landed a man on the moon on the 20th of July 1969. And it just so happens that the words that I am saying right now were scripted on the 55th anniversary of that exact day. This landing alone sparked a whole onslaught of research into our celestial neighbour that we haven't been able to do a lot of in the past. It's the only reason we now know how it formed, and it's the only reason we have our sights aimed at it becoming humanity's future fuel stop to the rest of the solar system. And all of that because we saw what was above us, got curious, and went against whatever reality threw at us just to get to where we wanted to be. If a headset like the Apple Vision Pro were to one day become incredibly prevalent, then there's a risk that with how controllable and customizable virtual reality can be, we may one day find it to be better than our own reality, and it would direct our attention away from the real world and slow our progress down to a halt. And over time, we would stop achieving great heights like we used to. Like how we went from a bunch of monkeys in Africa to starting one of the first civilizations in the Middle East, to expanding across Eurasia, to sailing across the Seven Seas in search of new land, to inventing math and science, to giving birth to the Industrial Revolution, to exploring the highest highs and the lowest lows of the Earth, to inventing computers, to landing a man on the moon, to launching space probes across our solar system, to creating a global communications network that allows for the storage and transmission of information that facilitate entire communities through text, audio, photos, and videos. Like this one. Is this all a stretch? Maybe, maybe not. There's really no telling how good or how bad things will go if a future like this came to fruition. But now, let's say that this whole headset ends up being a complete flop. No one buys it, Apple sweeps this whole thing under the rug and pretend like it never existed to begin with. Well, things will probably remain like just like how they are as of this video. Most people will not have a headset like the Apple Vision Pro and our lives will still involve the use of familiar devices like phones, tablets, laptops, and desktop computers. In such a scenario, we would not really be at the risk of our world turning towards a dystopian future where everyone just gets sucked into the virtual world. At least not for a while, because there's always that physical barrier that separates our world from the digital one. Your apps can only be as big as the display can be, and your games can, will only be as vibrant as how good your display is. And the audio can only get as good as your speakers can get. Hence, whenever we use our everyday devices, there will always be that physical boundary which would prevent most of us from just getting completely sucked away into our devices. I mean, of course, there are exceptions here and there. And, and as I said before, phone addictions are most definitely still a prevalent issue today. But for the most part, at least we wouldn't end up in a situation where most of us would forget that the real world even existed to begin with. On top of that, even if a future with mixed reality does eventually come one day, at least we would have a bit of time to work out the kinks and prepare ourselves for it, instead of being just thrown into it without any preparation and things go absolutely haywire. Kind of like how the smartphone's introduction came out of nowhere and we kind of just had to figure things out along the way. So yeah, no Ready Player One shit. But even in such a scenario where mixed reality headsets don't become a hit, that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any shortcomings. For starters, we would miss out on all of the benefits of mixed reality that I mentioned before. Immersive content that could bring people to places that they may not be able to visit in person, display 3D content more accurately than a conventional 2D display could, capture spatial videos that saves your memories with a whole new level of realism, and so much more. In fact, one of the future use cases of mixed reality that I have thought about is in the space industry. 
Now, as slow as it is progressing currently as compared to during the space race, space is the future and one day we will travel and live there in the same way that our ancestors eventually ex explored and conquered the entire planet. But doing so will require some technological advancements. I imagine that headsets like the Apple Vision Pro could one day be used to help future astronauts and pilots display trajectories and orbits in a 3D view that would help convey such information more accurately, since movements in space involves tapping into all three vectors of movement, unlike driving which for all intents and purposes mostly involves only two. This can be seen throughout many sci-fi shows, but one of the best portrayals of this is in the Amazon Prime original called The Expanse where holograms are used to help governors, captains, and vigilantes of the future to plan attacks or stealth missions in space. Now, we are still far from achieving holograms of such fidelity like in that show, but mixed reality headsets might be a stepping stone to such future technologies, which, now that I've mentioned it, brings up another good point. When the iPhone was first introduced, no one back then could have ever imagined that it could one day help people communicate to satellites for emergencies play console-level games like Death Stranding, or take high-quality videos that, to the untrained eye, look like something out of a cinema camera. In fact, this entire video is currently being recorded on my iPhone 14 Pro using cinematic mode. So, with that in mind, if we sacrificed a future with mixed reality headsets over one that's more safer, then we can't even begin to fathom just how much we could be missing out on. After all, we as humans have only progressed as far as we have because we kept on taking leaps of faith into the unknown and that has helped us to make it to where we are today. So will going on the more safer route really be the better option? Honestly, this is a decision that we are all going to have to make and it's not exactly one that's easy to make because we will have to choose between a brighter future with the risk of it becoming dystopian and a safer future with the risk of missing out on massive advancements. And even if that decision doesn't impact some of us, we simply don't give a crap. It will impact the rest of the world regardless, just like how smartphones and computers in general did. Sorry, there's red ants climbing all over me. Simply put, it's a really tricky dilemma where both could have incredible benefits but also potentially severe ramifications. But despite how difficult it would be, we will eventually have to land on one of them and that decision will be apparent when we see just how successful the Apple Vision lineup will be in the foreseeable future. Well, personally for me, I've always been an optimistic guy that will gun for the option that has risks, but at the end of the day has massive long-term benefits. So I'm gonna gun for the future with mixed reality, but what do you guys think? Leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. Now, some of you might be wondering about something this entire time. Winston, you are so obsessed with this headset to the point that you made a whole video about it from just two demo sessions. So, are you gonna buy it? Short answer, hell no. <laughs> just, I mean, look at the price alone. It's ridiculous for most people. And also, as of the recording of this video, I'm still serving the military, so I wouldn't really have a use case for it either way. And even if there somehow was one, it's not like I could waltz into a military camp with a headset with multiple cameras on it into sensitive areas of the camp. Long answer, well, not right now, because even if I did have a use case for it, I want to wait for a future model that is more fleshed out and mature, as well as being more affordable for the average consumer like myself. In that way, when I do buy the Apple Vision headset, then not only will it be more worth the price, but more of my family and friends will also have it, so I wouldn't end up in a situation where I can't use many of the social features on it because no one else has the headset. Plus, by that stage, more apps will hopefully be available on the Vision OS App Store and I will be able to do the things that I do on my MacBook on there instead. And maybe by then, I will be able to take what I already do good to a whole new level with spatial computing. So yeah, maybe I'll buy it later down the line instead. But what about you? Should you buy this thing? Well, if you not only have the disposable income to afford this thing, but you also truly believe that the features of the Apple Vision Pro will genuinely help you in what you do right now, even with the shortcomings that this headset may have, and you're also fully committed to Apple's vision for the future, ah, vision, get it? <laughs> then yeah, go for it. But for most people who aren't such hardcore Apple fans, who aren't made of money that just wants something that is affordable, reliable, and convenient, then waiting for a future model would probably be a far more logical purchase decision.
Okay, so um, since we still have a bit of time, let's quickly head back inside. I also just dropped my left mic here and you are back at home as we wait so long. Now let's just let's go back and get it. Ooh, okay. Now we are finally back home. God, that was a it was quite hot. <laughs> Okay, so before each of my Apple Vision Pro demos, I actually asked on Instagram if you guys had any questions about the Apple Vision Pro before I tried them on. And although there weren't that many, there were still a few questions that got sent my way, so let's quickly check them out. Firstly, what games are playable? Okay, so that really depends on what kind of games you're talking about. Many of those typical games like Fruit Ninja, Jetpack Joyride 2, and Cut the Rope 3 are available to download either as a dedicated Vision Pro app or as an iPad or iPhone app that can run on the headset. But if you're talking about more demanding games like Minecraft, Genshin Impact, or Call of Duty, you are not going to find such games available. Well, okay, maybe except for Vac Vacation Simulator, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> the reason for this is not really because the headset can't run it, it's just that the developers have decided not to release them to the Vision Pro App Store just yet. Either because they need more time to develop for the new platform, or they feel like they just aren't ready to invest in building their apps for this platform just yet. Although there are ways to circumvent this by streaming your PlayStation, Xbox, Windows or Mac display into the headset and playing through there instead. But with that method, you're, you, you're gonna have to make sure that, that the latency is as low as possible in order for it to be playable, and some services may require a subscription to use. Next question. <laughs> porn. <laughs> no question mark, just porn. <laughs> well, I mean, not that I, ad I uh, advocate for the consumption of such content, but... Theoretically, you could. I mean, the full-fledged Safari is available on the headset, so yeah, you could watch that kind of stuff, but to a much more immersive degree. Just just make sure to put on some headphones and like turn off eyesight, especially if you're in a room with other people. I'm saying that because knowing how cursed the human mind is, and the fact that there are more than 8 billion of us as of the recording of this video, I know that there are probably a lot of people who have already done that. So yeah, just please just don't watch porn. It, it, it ain't good for your head, just, 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 just don't. <laughs> Next up, scenic bathroom break. Again, not a question, just a statement. Well, I mean, yeah, with immersive environments, you could turn your crap in your musky toilet into a crap on the moon. <laughs> just so, so yeah, just do with that information however you will. Final question. Can bring to military camp? <laughs> okay, this is probably one of my military buddies asking. Um, you know, ask your superiors. Although I'm pretty sure most will not allow you to bring something like this in, especially for something that's so new and radical compared to any other typical portable computer like a smartphone or a tablet. Maybe a few years down the line, this will change, but, but for now, we are gonna have to wait a little bit. So yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. This is something very new. I've never really done or recorded anything like this before. It's completely, completely radical for me as well. It's a new format that I haven't done before, and this is probably one of the few videos that I will be recording in full fat 4K 30 FPS, so this is gonna be quite a pain in, in the ass to record. I already can tell, I can predict it. This will take freaking forever. In fact, this video is probably probably coming out in August or like <laughs> early September, even though this is all being recorded in like end of June and early of July. <laughs> So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to see more content like it, drop a thumbs up. You, you, know, you know what to do down, down below, you know? And I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye!